It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It's a Wisdom Wednesday presented, of course, by DraftKings. Thank goodness for those dudes. We are only two days away from a new winner being announced. Spread the word. Where are those Spotify wraps? I'm not seeing them. Maybe I'm not looking hard enough. But do the Spotify thing where you show how many minutes you've been listening to the show. And then tweet it to at Ross Tucker Pod, at Ross Tucker NFL. I want to see it. Sponsor confirmation email winner. So many good sponsors right now. It's like Hansel. So hot right now. ExpressVPN, Raycon, Masterworks. Awesome. And then the YouTube shout out, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Just subscribe, make a comment. Really looking forward to giving away, maybe not even one. I might even give away two Madden codes tomorrow. Not really into the Thursday night game that much. Rams, Raiders. I want to make sure people have them for the holidays. Make sure you're looking for that and how you can actually win one of the Madden codes tomorrow. At Ross Tucker NFL is what you want to be looking at. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. So arguably the biggest story in the NFL right now, the 49ers quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo's hurt. So they bring it in a rookie from Iowa State, Mr. Irrelevant Brock Purdy. I thought, hmm, who do I know that could maybe talk about playing at Iowa State and then for Kyle Shanahan? How about one of my favorite teammates ever, Sage Rosenfels? Sage, I don't want to short you. 12 years in the NFL? Well, Ross, as you know, we all like to add as much uh, time uh, in the league as possible to our resumes. 11 uh, accrued seasons, so for retirement reasons, 11. But I, the way I look at it is my 12th training camp. I went through the whole training camp, all four preseason games, and I made more money than my rookie year and my second year. So I certain I and I got cut. So I sort of feel like that. I'm just going to count number twelve. What uh, year? Uh, who that. was that? Who was who cut who, you? Oh, uh, it would have been um, you know Rick Spielman traded for me twice, and he was the GM at the time in Minnesota. So um, Leslie Frazier, Christian Ponder uh, was the quarterback uh and joe webb who ended up being a really good special teams player in the league for about 10 years uh he was one of the other uh, uh quarterbacks um and then a kid i can't remember his name he's been play playing in canada like ever since he got a cannon uh he was the law firm because he had like three names i can't you know there's probably a couple of those every once in a while but i, I remember, can't remember i his... don't know who that is but i remember that kid. i can't yeah. i can't think of his name right now it's early i haven't had, had much coffee yet but uh, uh yeah so that was it 2012 and and it's been you know 10 years i think this is my 11th like season uh post playing career uh you would sort of ask me uh, what what am i up to off the air you know i that's a good question <laughs> I sort of feel like I do a little of everything. I don't have sort of the media career. You have really done an incredible job of, of diving into what you've done, uh, you know, post your career and and uh, ha have a whole list of things. You know, in a media career, it's not like you have one job. You have like 20. Ross Tucker has 20 media jobs. I see him here, see him there. We'll do a pregame show at the Super Bowl. We got this. He's selling this over here. He's got podcasts. He's on Dan Patrick on my idols. He's filling in. I mean, you, you have a real, real career. I occasionally do some, I got to hustle. Dude. I didn't shows. make as much money as you did. I, I wasn't a 12 year quarterback. I got to hustle, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I stay busy. I stay busy. Got two kids off to college, one, uh, left to go. Um, and, uh, life is good. Life is good. I get to travel a lot. I get to go to a lot of football games, uh, college and pro get to go to my kids events and dance dad stuff. And, uh, you know, see my kids that are in college as much as I can and see old friends when I get to travel around. So, uh, you know, my life is pretty good. It's, uh, one of my old podcaster uh, partners calls it the Sage Rosenfeld's experience. And it's different when you quasi retire at 35 years old. And what are you going to do, uh, you know, with the, with the rest of your time? Uh, and so I, you know, I, I try to try to enjoy myself as much as possible by, by traveling and doing different things. That is incredible. I love it. You'll never regret it. And it definitely makes me feel old 
that your kids are in college. Yes. You know, Sage, it was interesting. Sage and I were rookies together, 2001, with the Washington Redskins. Marty Schottenheimer drafted Sage, signed me. And then the next year, Sage and I were like good buddies and then got traded during preseason by Spurrier to the Dolphins. I'll never forget that. But you had your kids early, man, obviously. Um, I remember that. And now they're in college. Wow, you got to be the youngest college dad ever. Like when you go <laughs> no, visit oh, them, no. when you, you visit them, what do they even – like their friend must be like, that's your dad? One, we have to – in the Midwest, people have kids young for whatever reason. So 23 to 26 is like a strike zone. In the East Coast, I feel like, or West Coast, it's like I'm 30 – people are 38 and having their first one, you know. So uh, it's not as unusual in the Midwest. But, yeah, 23 years old, rookie. My son was born July 3rd, uh, 22 days before our rookie training camp uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania. You, you and I up there sweating, uh, playing Marty ball. Uh, you know, trying to make it in this league. And then, of course, Spurrier comes in next year. Uh, uh, I, I end up getting traded. But you and I, you know, we played together. You and I played together in Osaka, Japan. We yeah. played football in Osaka, Japan in a baseball dome. I mean, simply incredible. And the only really cheers you heard is when we punted or kicked off. It was incredible. But, uh, yeah, you and I go way back. We go way back. And uh, we have followed this league uh, and, and the sport of football. But you are you are deep into it. And I... Uh, get to not be as deep, but yet I, I still do cover a few teams every single year, it seems like. And, and I'm, I do a little gambling show on Friday with Lawrence Tynes, one of my uh, uh, former uh, kickers for the New York Giants. And so, uh, you know, I stay busy enough, have two or three uh, of these a week and, and and really enjoy it and really still enjoy following the league. It's it's the best soap opera around. There's nothing better than the National Football League. Uh, great games, you know, you know, millionaire players, billionaire owners and coaches and egos and excitement. And it, it's it's going to be a part of my life and until the day I die. All right, let's dive into Brock Purdy. Now, first of all, I was joking on some show I am convinced he was Iowa State starting quarterback for the better part of a decade. I mean, I feel like he was Iowa State's quarterback for so long. I don't know how he still looks like he's 16 because he was there forever. I'm not talking NFL at all yet. Let's pretend he never played an NFL game. Yeah. Talk to me, Sage, about Brock Purdy at Iowa State, your alma mater. He probably broke all your records or Seneca Wallace's records or whoever. What did you see and think of him during his time in Ames? I can recall the day I showed up for a two days practice and looking at the quarterbacks. Of course, that's why I sort of focus on when I go. I usually go every year, spring ball too. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm out there and there's a starter and then there's a backup and then there's this sort of short, squatty third string guy. And I'm talking to our head coach, sort of right hand guy. And he's like, that, that kid, this kid Brock Purdy, he's going to be a little player. And I'm like, really? Like this little squatty kid doesn't have a big arm. You know, they're, they're doing some red zone throw drills and he, he's accurate, but doesn't have any big arm by, by what, so our ball's not spinning great. And then they go into the team drills and man, he he's, he's hitting guys. He gets the ball out quick. You know, it's a bubble boom. He's just, it's like a second baseman throwing it over. And then he scrambles around a couple of times and makes some great plays. I'm like, huh, let, let, I want, well, what's going to happen to this kid? Well, his career was like that uh, as a player at Iowa state. Um, they threw the ball a lot. Matt Campbell is in shotgun for the most part, a lot of RPOs and a lot of those types of things, not under center, not outside zone and play action. Um, they have their own sort of style of offense, but it, it makes the quarterback uh, have to be creative and have to lot, sometimes do a lot. And uh, there's they have their pass patterns too, but um, they like to read things fully across the board. Well, a lot of times things that, as you know, break down when you have – uh, uh, longer passes or 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 plays uh, like that, these long progression type of plays, and so the 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 the, the guys up front would break down and Brock be running around making plays and making great throws a lot of times, extremely accurate, rarely you know great anticipation, uh, great creativity, sort of like a gunslinger Brett Favre. You would think like back at you know uh, at Southern Miss, right? And and um, I was so impressed by it as a true freshman about week four or five, they throw him in there. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm just thinking when I was 18, I couldn't hit it. When I was a rookie, I couldn't really hit anybody in practice. Right. I, the game was, I, I hadn't evolved. I haven't caught up to the game yet. And and then same with when I was in high school, hadn't really got to like the college level of accuracy. Brock was already there. 
he, he, he had great throwing mechanics and great accuracy and could, could make plays and maybe didn't know what he was doing, but he was running around making plays and they had a good season and, you know, four bowl games, they went nine and three, which was uh, the same as my, my team's record, by the way, never got past nine wins. They won a Fiesta bowl, a uh, great season. You know, he had Brees Hall running back and uh, probably David Montgomery for a year, uh, you know, a couple of good, really tight ends, NFL tight ends. And so he had some weapons there. Um, and he was a really good player. Yeah, broke all the school records by far. Like Seneca, we didn't throw the ball like this. I mean, we were like a run-oriented team. I threw 10 touchdown passes my senior year. So Brock has all the records. They won't be broken for a long, long time, if ever. And he won a lot of football games. So after the season ends, I start working with him and Will Hewlett, who's like my throwing coach for, for college and, and, and high school kids. Uh, he lives down in Jacksonville. And so, so Brock and I were doing these Zoom sessions, watching film to try to get him caught up. Because there is this jump between college and pro football, as you know, from an X and O standpoint. So there's all these throwing things in the combine and you know, let's get this guy throwing the ball. I, I'm more worried about up here because if they can get NFL thinking early, they can have a better chance of making the team and impressing the coaches at the combine or the senior bowl. So we spend about 15 hours uh, over the course of two weeks between the season and the combine watching film together, right? When we watch film, we watch San Francisco 49ers film. We watch Green Bay Packers film. We watch uh, um, Sean McVay, LA Rams film. Why? Because that's how I see football. I was, you know, as you know, I was Marty Schottenheimer, Brian Schottenheimer, right? Uh, they went to North Turner. I had uh, uh, Gilbride in there at the end with Eli. I had Daryl Bevel. But when I played for Gary Kubiak and Kyle Shanahan, I learned football in a way that I hadn't learned from other coaches in my life. And it helped me really like just understand it better so I could then anticipate and play uh, with conviction and play uh, with anticipation. So when I teach football, I teach it from their perspective. And I actually think their perspective uh, is, as you know, about half the league is running, quote unquote, that offense at this point. I mean, Atlanta is, of course, Miami is, all these. So my, my, I'm like, well, he'll, he'll at least be able to talk the language and, and know the lingo when he's you know, talking to these coaches and whatnot for about half the teams. And so sure enough, San Francisco drafts him, you know, as you know, Mr. Irrelevant, the last pick of the draft. And he plays pretty well in the preseason. Um, of course, uh, this, you know, it's, I was talking to Mike Silver last night for, for my podcast and, and he said, you know, he went there for training camp and was just watching. It was just this weird thing. Jimmy's over here throwing by himself because they're trying to trade him. Uh, the starting quarterbacks sort of sometimes he's accurate, sometimes he's not. And then there's this little, this Brock Purdy guy who seems to be extremely confident in himself and his capabilities and his hitting guys and people, you know, I, I think Mike Shanahan really liked him. Like Mike Shanahan really like like this kid and so it was just interesting to hear mike's perspective as a sort of beat reporter on the ground out there in in, in santa clara uh what he thought of him when he first met him and i tell you what you're, you're when you watch this kid i i think he, this offense might be perfect for him i might be perfect for him he he gets the, he will try to create uh, uh, sometimes, but he's extremely accurate with a really, really quick release. And I see him as sort of a Drew Brees with a little bit more mobility um, and intermediate routes, short routes, all the quick stuff he's, he's usually pretty dang good at. He's not going to throw it 65 yards down the field. Like, I don't know if Brock Purdy can throw it 55 yards. I don't. I don't know if he can throw it 55 yards. That's just not the way he is. But on on uh, intermediate stuff, he has great anticipation, great accuracy, and I'm really actually excited to see him work in Kyle Shanahan's offense. I mean, Kyle wanted a more mobile quarterback. That's why I got rid of Jimmy. Brock actually is. He actually is a, a really mobile quarterback. He's not a four foot. He's not Justin Fields, but he really does like to scramble. I spent four years watching it, uh, and he's very creative with it. You're going to see pump fakes. You're going to see the Brett Favre pump fake. Uh, you know, over the course of the next month or, or so. So I'm really excited to see in that first game, it's exactly what you want. He threw 37 passes that first game, 25 or 37 for 210. So you start going, well, there's a lot of short and intermediate passes there. He's getting the ball out. And that's what you want, that style of offense. Get the ball out quick, get to Debo, get to Kittle, get to whoever, and let them work and not hold on to the ball so long, which is really what we did in college. And so – we know he's got a great team around him. We know he has the the best defense in the National Football League. We know he's got playmakers on offense. There's a running game. 
Um, so I think the, the the table is sort of set for this kid as a rookie. Um, and so for me as like an Iowa Stater and him and I, Iowa Stater and hadn't worked with him, it's an extremely intriguing experiment for me to sort of watch, uh, uh, you know, this, this kid uh, right in the spotlight as a rookie. Um, and it doesn't happen very often. I, I feel like what, every three to five years, it happened to where like a rookie uh, a, ends up being the starter seventh round pick or fourth round pick and the, the team's like a legit playoff contender. And so it's like, what do they do? Um, well, they didn't go out and get Baker Mayfield. I don't know if they had the, they probably didn't have the opportunity to, cause the, the Rams are bad, I guess, but, um, they probably could trade for him if they really wanted to, uh, you know, I, well, I guess Jimmy, Jimmy just got hurt, but either way they're, they're going with Brock. Um, and I'm excited to see, see what happens here. That's cool. I didn't know you worked with him. Um, I guess I'm curious, did anybody from like, how did it work out that you were the one working with him? Like, did his agent reach out to you? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so you know how this sort of this thing goes. These college players are done, and most of them either have an agent or they're getting an agent or whatever, and, and those agents all have a plan for them, right? Uh, sometimes that plan is, hey, you're just going to stay at your college and work out with your college strength coach. Um, a lot of them have these plans. If you're going to go to Arizona, you're going to go to Texas, you're going to go to Florida, wherever it might be, uh, to train with you know these guys to get you faster because it's all about what's your 40 speed at the combine and so you sort of become like a track athlete for for a little while um and you know will uh, my friend will hewlett he's a throwing coach and and there's, there's plenty of those around the country too and he and i have worked together in the past uh, ian book the year before I, I worked with ian book as a junior in college and he was in a senior um, i really like l working with those kids who have spent four years in college and you just, it's incredible what they don't know. It's incredible what they don't know. I, I, I'm telling you, Ross, uh, uh, what what college quarterbacks don't know and however college offenses work, they get to the NFL and it's sort of mind blowing for them. And it doesn't take more. I had a teammate, Ryan Harklaw. He was a teammate. You, you would know who he, he was. He was undrafted like you are year. Didn't make the team. But he said in the first two days in Jacksonville training camp with Tom Coughlin, he learned more probably than he learned in four years of college, right? So as you know, there's like these big jumps sometimes depending on who your college coaches are uh, to the National Football League. And, um, you know, obviously I had work, I think working with the will, of course, it was just a natural thing. So yeah, the agent contacts us and said, hey, would you like to work with Brock, you know, uh, throw some money your way. But honestly, I, I wanted to work with him anyway. I had worked with Brock I don't know, before COVID, but he and I, anytime there's a starting quarterback at Iowa State, I see, I try to try to at some point develop a little relationship with them and then go have some meeting time with them. Like, hey, do you want to spend three or four hours watching NFL film? And of course they love it. Now it's different than what they're used to and how they see the game. But I think any time you can learn information about maybe how a coverage might work or how, yeah, it looks like cover four now, but this guy over here is telling you that this safety over here to the right is going to come down. So you actually, you can anticipate it's going to be cover three, right? And there's all these little tips that, of course, veteran guys like myself have just acquired over the years. And the more I can pass down that knowledge to these young guys, it's, for me, it's uh, it, it's extremely enjoyable. What is it you said, you know, because I know you played for a bunch of teams before you played and, and in a bunch of systems before you played with Gary Kubiak and Kyle Shanahan in Houston. What is it? that you that they taught you like what how did they because yeah. i didn't play for them so what what is it that they taught you that was so phenomenal that's a good question i think of all the things coverage wise kyle was so good about giving you a deeper understanding of how defenses how their coverages work, like the really, really precise details of what's going on in cover four, right? Uh, you know, whose responsibility is who, uh, what the safety's looking at, what their eyes are looking at, because he sat in meetings with Monty Kiffin. I, it actually goes back to this. Kyle Shanahan, when he was with Tampa and Gruden, when he first get, came into the league, he had to sit in a lot of meetings or worked with Monty Kiffin uh, sometime when he was there. And when you do that from an offensive perspective, you actually get to see exactly the words, the the eyes, the the thought processes of all what the defense is, whether it's cover three, man, whatever it might be, you know. And there's so many types of man, 
right? And um, but yeah, he had all that. That knowledge was so valuable uh, to all of us. That's number one. I feel I really understood how coverages work again, so I can anticipate uh, uh, even more. Um, the running game mixed with the bootleg and play action. The running game mixed with the bootleg and play action. That is a game changer for a quarterback. If you look at all the stats, uh, play action passes or bootleg passes, they take the 32nd best quarterback and the first best, the best quarterback, Pat Mahomes, and right, they make them actually fairly equal because the the the, the play action itself usually gets the player open. And you don't have as a quarterback, you don't have to fit balls around these windows. Uh, where linebackers and safeties are just dropping back into some designed coverage to pre prevent you from having a completion or prevent you from throwing the ball deep. This, this style of offense forces the defense to play all the gaps. And it doesn't matter if you get a yard or three yards on a lot of runs. All right, because if you're getting two yards, which, you know, back in the days, you know, four yards is like, that's a good run. If you get two yards, on a run and you run outside zone, you are forcing the defense to play every gap from the center to the sideline. They all have to be in the precise location to stop that run. Okay. Um, if they're, if they're in those gaps, they're not in their pass drops. Okay. So you can, and, and the action looks the same. The action looks the same and it, it, it's extended from the center to the running back. That action is what a second and a half or something like that the shotgun token fake that's like a half a second so since the action is longer the defense plays those gaps longer which allows a couple of things one the receivers to get further down the field to actually throw the ball deep as you know the hardest thing to do in the national football league is to drop back pass and just throw it deep right you got as a left tackle you got to hold on uh for your dear life play action you just get to come off and smash into a three technique and run him down and 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 he's going to keep that uh, he's going to keep that gap why because his job in the running game is to keep that gap so another thing it's doing is it's not allowing the defenses to rush the passer they have to play the run so all those stud defensive ends and stud uh tackles uh they are not up the field pressure trying to get to the quarterback they are stopping the run first so it forces those guys to to uh, do a different responsibility as well but then again yeah the time uh it, it allows you as, as a quarterback and then the protection a lot of times is really really good uh because the line sort of makes a fence as they go down the line and and the, again the defense has to play the run as you know you a good play action team you'll see them back there 10 yards deep, like nobody around him or, or, or in a bootleg, nobody around him. That's why bootlegs are so great because you get out there and it's like, wait, I actually have time to think and see out here uh, or possibly run. Uh, right. So there's just so much. Um, it's just so hard on a defense, I think, uh, to do those things. The, the world sort of went to this RPO game, which I get it. There's I, I think RPOs are, are good where they are. There's a spot for them. But. It, it, it makes it hard maybe on one player, right? There's like, oh, there's players in consternation, but it doesn't make it hard on everybody. And the game then is just sort of like here and it's not sideline to sideline uh, as far as, you know, forcing defensive linemen, everybody to run sideline to sideline. So I, I just think that it's Kirk Cousins is 10 and two and Kirk Cousins, he, he's not, he's not a great quarterback. He, you, you, these top five guys, he doesn't, he's right. But, but it allows him to just do his job and be successful. And if you look at an average Vikings game, for example, 30 passes, Kirk Cousins has 30 passes, half of them would be play actions or bootlegs, half. So I think you're, you're, you're an offensive lineman. I only really have to pass block 15 times. Like per Sounds set. good to me. Sounds good to you. I bet they have the other 15, four screens, whether it's a wide receiver screen or a play action tight end screen. Those are the great ones. Or you got a tight end on a Daniil Hunter or some great defensive end out there. And yet you want him to get beat. Perfect. We'll throw a screen to, to our, to our tight end. They'll be four or so five. You, know, you, you just, you just earned yourself. Not that you had to, we're going to have a much longer conversation in the off season. Yeah. This yeah. was phenomenal. Uh, awesome. I can't wait to see the feedback uh, that we're able to get from it. Check out my boy on Twitter, please. He's at Sage Rosenfels18, which is his number. That was awesome. 
Sage, really appreciate it. That's so cool. I didn't even know when I texted you that you'd been working with Brock Purdy. That makes it even perfect. Thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, Ross. Thanks for having me on. That was awesome. So are Raycon earbuds. Their wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers offer premium sound, useful features, and almost custom, comfortable fit, up to 54 hours of battery life. I'm grabbing mine right now for those of you that are watching on YouTube. I love these babies. My blue Raycon earbuds, they don't stick way out of your ear. I use them all the time when I work out. Uh, they've been life-changing for me. Seriously, I was not an earbud guy until I got these Raycon earbuds. You can find Raycon in stores now, like Kohl's or Walmart, but the best deal is at buyraycon.com slash Tucker. Go to buyraycon.com slash Tucker to get 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY plus free shipping. That's code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash Tucker for 15% off your Raycon purchase. Buyraycon.com slash Tucker. Tuck's Takes. Good morning, Ross. We'll start with Titans. Fire GM John Robinson promote Ryan Coden to the interim GM. Well, this is going to be our Labatt Blue Tuck of the Day, presented by Labatt Blue Light, the pristine Canadian Pilsner. Share a Labatt with friends this football season. I don't believe in coincidences. A.J. Brown catches a couple touchdown passes, big game against the Titans, his former team, the GM that traded him gets fired two days later. I mean, really? Don't believe in coincidences. Now, I have so many questions. Was this a power play by Vrabel because he wanted more influence in the organization? Did ownership need to scapegoat someone when maybe they didn't want to pay A.J. Brown but it blew up so much in their faces. Maybe, but again, timing, right? The timing doesn't make sense. The, the timing doesn't make sense if they think it's the overall roster. This had something to do with A.J. Brown. Maybe, maybe John Robinson is the one that decided not to pay him and the ownership didn't like it. Whatever it is, I don't believe in coincidences. This is clearly directly related to what A.J. Brown did to the Titans on Sunday. You will never convince me otherwise. Tux takes. Ravens signed quarterback Brett Hundley to their practice squad of Lamar Jackson and poorly out one to three weeks with a PCL injury. Hundley's there basically to back up um, Tyler Huntley. Boy, they got a couple Huntleys now, huh? Um, Tyler does put pretty well. I, I think Tyler will play pretty well. Uh, I guess that's good for Lamar Jackson. One to three weeks to be back for the playoffs. They need Huntley to hold it down for them. Huntley to hold it down. Tyler Huntley to hold it down for them in the meantime. But then I always wonder with a guy like Lamar Jackson, since mobility is such a factor, would seem to reason to probably be on the longer end of that. And just how effective will he be running when he comes back? Tux takes. Eagles defensive end Robert Quinn going on IR with a knee scope out four weeks while the Broncos cut safety Anthony Harris. Anthony Harris has kind of gotten around this offseason. Robert Quinn, yeah, I mean, he didn't look right. You could tell something was going on there, and I guess something with his knees bothering him. Eagles want to try to make sure they get him healthy for the playoff run. Tux takes. Niners signed quarterback Josh Johnson. They announced Jimmy G will, might be back in seven to eight weeks. And most notably, the Rams claim Baker Mayfield off the waiver wire. Well, there's a lot there, Jack. So I want to start with this. Uncommongoods.com has the absolute best gifts for everyone in your life. I'm a big believer in unique and creative gifts. And that's what Uncommon Goods has. Look, if you just go to a store, and I've done this, it's really hard to know what to get your people, wife, mom. It's hard, really hard. Skip the gifts that scream last minute 
and find something truly original at uncommongoods.com. They even have awesome classes, art and jewelry, mixology classes, crafts, gardening. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash Tucker. That's uncommongoods.com slash Tucker for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer, Uncommon Goods. We are all out of the ordinary. A lot of out of the ordinary stuff there um, with the quarterback stuff. Josh Johnson, unbelievable. How many? Tra- he, he literally might have the record for most transactions of any player in NFL history. Jimmy G being back in seven, eight weeks is good, but I mean, he's not going to play unless Purdy really falters, right? Seven weeks is a divisional round. It's not like, oh, Jimmy G, you've been out for seven weeks and Brock Purdy won us enough games that were in the divisional round at Philadelphia or at Minnesota or whatever. Oh, let's just put Jimmy G back in. No, it's not. they're not going to do that at that point because that means Purdy will have been playing well. Now, at that point, maybe is Jimmy G the backup? And maybe is Jimmy G then capable at that point of going out and – you know, coming in if Purdy struggles in a playoff game, maybe, but he's not coming back to start at that point. And then the Baker Mayfield thing, you know, first of all, um, I always wonder, like in a situation like this, did someone from the Rams behind the scenes say to Baker Mayfield, you should try to uh, get released. See if you can get released. We'd love to have you for the last few games of the year. And maybe that's the Rams. Or maybe Baker Mayfield just did it because – He wanted to be able to play for the Niners and thought he could get to the Niners. But that's not what happened. He got cut uh, and got claimed by the Rams. I'm happy. I'm calling Packers-Rams Monday Night Football in a couple weeks. And I'm hoping Baker's the quarterback. Makes it more interesting, more intriguing if Baker's quarterback. I don't think he'll play tomorrow night against the Raiders. That would surprise me a lot. That's a lot to learn in a very short time, but they might be trying to get them ready because after tomorrow night's game, they got 10 days before that Monday night game against the Packers. Maybe they'll try to get Baker ready and evaluate him for the rest of the year because here's the thing I haven't heard other people say other than sportsinjurycentral.com, Jack, that you know I'm a big fan of. I don't think I've said this, but Stafford has a bruised spinal cord. Something hit the spinal cord. That's probably a disc in his neck. That's a problem. You can't have things hitting your spinal cord, which means if he wants to continue playing, he very likely has to have neck surgery to stop the disc from hitting the spinal cord. Trust me, been there, done that. And so if he doesn't want to have the surgery, then his career is probably over. Stafford has to make that decision. So I think the Rams want to see what Baker has in case Stafford decides to call quits. I never call it quits at Pizza Boy Brewing. Probably should. Delicious. Sporticulture, humanheadnyc.com, steakhousesports.com, go-bangles.com, Vision Comics with an X, backofficescheduler.com. In fact, I need to get I need to get my front page story.com on over at Uncommon Goods. That's like a perfect Uncommon Goods type of uh, gift right there myfrontpagestory.com. Even money's up. College draft is up. Check them out if you haven't, please. Fantasy Feast Part 1 will be posted uh, pretty shortly. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, rostucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.